Okay, so today the plan is to go over the temple consecrations, uh, how they work, uh, why we use them, and, uh, and compare and contrast, because there is a, a pattern behind them that you'll see throughout the different consecrations that we use. But first, I have a couple of things I wanted to share. Uh, if you guys are working on your tarot, you can go to the builders of the Atidum and order for not very much money, a set of tarot blanks that you can paint yourself. Uh, there's the little logo on the builders of the Atidum. And they're a wonderful group. They've been around for a really long time. And painting your own cards is a lot of fun. So I've, this is one of the things I've been working on for a group. So we can use them in ritual. The large size like that will make them very visual, uh, visually easy. Um, so when we do the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, we've been doing the banishing activity. And when you banish, you go from earth up to spirit. You can imagine that as a great big broom clearing all the elements, washing it all up into spirit so that the space around you is cleared. One of the things that was done in the early Golden Dawn is people were instructed at some point in their um, progress to do the invoking form in the mornings and the banishing form in the evenings. Some people did uh, the LBRP up to three times a day was some of the uh, instruction. So the invoking form, which you might want to do in the morning, as you can imagine, is you would start at spirit, go down to earth, and then to water, air, earth, back up spirit, and then down to earth again to to seal it, to solidly create the pentagram. And what this is going to do is, if you do it in the morning, it's going to raise your energy levels for the day. It's as we banish, we're cleaning out all of the elemental uh, energies, uh, disruptive. As we invoke, we're calling energy in. And so the LBRP can be done in an invoking form as well as a banishing form. And that is something that you can add to your practice. You wouldn't want to do the invoking form at night before you went to bed because it might wake you up, make it harder to sleep. So as the general rule, in, invoke towards, banish away. So that you can use this symbol as a way to tune your environment. And we'll get back to this too when we talk about the um, temple consecrations, because this comes up again, because this is going to be a primary tool for creating the energies of the temple consecration. So I posted on our site three versions of the temple consecration. Uh, we have the ones that we wrote for ours. Temple of Limitless Light, the Temple of Kim, and the Nakian Star Temple, which is, of course, about my favorite. It's one of the ones that Brian wrote. And in our the document that's for our group, Temple of Limitless Light, I've written sort of a couple pages of just sort of a general outline of what's going on in a temple consecration. So to start with, why do we want to do a temple consecration? Well, the purpose is to sanctify the space and to create a magical circle of protection and to call our spiritual allies in to assist and aid in the ritual process to keep things on the level. And by creating the four watchtowers, we create anchor points that we can build even more complex and interesting sacred geometry on. And it also says, this is our universe. 
this is our universe that we're going to use as a basis for creating what our will is. Whatever we want to do, whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish, this is our space. So when you create a sacred space using a ritual like a temple consecration, you're creating your own universe, your own model of the universe where you're acting as a creator. Or as a group, we're all acting as a creator together. And we are going to, even if we're only watching, we're going to give our energy to the people that are doing the ritual work, they're going through the motions and we're going to be identifying with them so that we're all in together as one unit, as an egregore. So you can do this on your own at home or when we do it together as a group, hopefully we'll be able to divide up parts and everybody can have an opportunity to participate in the, the temple consecration itself. So there's a pattern that is employed to create the, this ritual. That pattern itself is pretty simple. It begins with an introit. Now, an introit is basically a statement of what we're going to be doing and a very, very short guided visualization. For temple consecrations, it is usually a creation myth. The idea is that we have come to a, say, a place, we have done some preliminary work like meditation and such, and now we're beginning the journey. Then a ritual is a journey. It's a journey to the other world to achieve some kind of boon, some kind of goal that then you're going to bring back to the physical world, to your life, where you're going to um, share it with the world and improve things in general, the hero's journey. So let's start with the Temple of Kim. This is probably one of the first ones, I think, uh, that was written for the order. So it begins, to, if you look at the, the document that I posted on our site, it's written in a specific format that is as a temple document as a part of our order um, would make sense. Usually they have, yeah, the Star Temple has it on it, some kind of indication as to what level you're supposed to be uh, in your process of initiation and the preliminary. So like the Temple of Kim says, first there's meditation and the Kabbalistic cross. But this is a, a pretty old, this is probably one of the, the first temple consecrations that they wrote. So this one doesn't even have uh, tolls of the bell. A lot of times at the beginning of these rituals, there'll be a number of bell tolls that is significant. It will have some point of geometri geometria, um, numerology or something to indicate what the bell tolls are. Often I use four or five just to, rec to represent the nodes of the four directions that we're going to activate before the, you know, in the process of the temple uh, consecration. So here we have the introduction, uh, the desert wind blows over the pyramids as a solar disk descends through the Western skies into the abodes of night. So at night, the sun would begin a journey through the underworld, which is, if we're doing ritual, that's where we're going. We're going to the underworld, the other side. Entering the river valley, which is splashed with the colors of twilight, we see that the earth is rich and fertile, and then appears the Nile. Flowing majestically towards the sea, we pay homage to the deities of the Nile and its lands, for the Nile is as the grail, which heals the barren earth, and which sustains the hearts of those who seek the eternal truth. And so they're bringing it back to the grail, the grail representing the many things, but probably more specifically, without getting to uh, a hour long grail discussion, the divine feminine, uh, healing the earth, healing humanity by connection to the divine feminine, which we want to emphasize since the divine masculine has been emphasized for so long. So that's the intro for an Egyptian theme. 
so for the Anakian Star Temple, he is going into the mythology of the Nephilim, um, these angelic forces, extraterrestrials maybe, whatever you want, that came to Earth to teach humanity um, civilization and basically. So here we have in ancient times, long before the rise of human mankind civil well, humanity civilization, unity became duality. A war was raged throughout the inner planes between the powers of light and darkness. Thus duality and its eternal conflict came into being. The forces of light and darkness each included 400 stellar beings called angels by the ancients. Separate from these beings, a third force existed, 400 angels who remembered the state of unity and who chose to transcend duality, the duality of light and darkness. They became the stellar guardians of the grail, grail again, keepers of the divine gnosis, that towards which we aspire. So the intros are very different because they're coming from different mythologies, different storylines. And we use mythology because we're entering into a state of the underworld of the subconscious, of the superconscious. We're connecting with the greater aspects of ourselves. It doesn't matter if it's literally true. It's mythologically true. The idea um, of the grail, it's repeated. The idea in the Egyptian one is we're going to this mythic uh, version of Egypt. The sun is going down at the time of night, traveling through the underworld. With the star temple, we're imagining at the beginning of time how duality came into being, which is our reality is basically based on duality. But this other force existed that was going to bring humanity knowledge. Uh, so for ours, this is basically from a vision I had um, doing ritual on ages ago. And it was such a strong vision for me. Uh, it kind of appears in different forms sometimes in other rituals that I do, uh, visionary, uh, that I thought it was a good basis for a personal version of a temple consecration. We stand in a garden of our own creation. The foliage is luxuriant and in full bloom. The fruit trees hang heavy with the harvest of our own effort and diligence. For a moment, we pause at the fountain to refresh ourselves and enjoy the gentle aromatic breeze, the fountain, the grail. Then we stand and start down the path that leads beyond the wall into the wilderness. And we're stepping away from all the things that we've worked for and created. We've done a lot of hard work. So now we're going into the untamed, the older parts of our psyche. The forest beyond the wall is ancient and huge. We hear the calls of birds, beasts, and insects. The path leads to an ancient place in the heart of the wilderness, to a megalithic circle of polished stone, wherein is found the obsidian gateway. There we are confronted with a dark reflection of ourselves within the cold stone. With courage, we banish all doubt and fear, and with acceptance, we claim our power. Thus whole and empowered, we step through our reflection and beyond. So that is a personal uh, vision written as a temple opening. So you can see you can take a mythology uh, that is from human history or something personal to as the basis for your idea of creating sacred space. So in mine, I'm taking it from a vision where we go from the ordered uh, self-created um, world to the more wild and untamed parts and then the mirrored, the obsidian gateway. Okay, it's the idea of what we see ourselves through a mirror darkly, right? When we look in the mirror, we see the flaws. We see those aspects of ourselves that um, we're not as proud of sometimes. It's kind of like if you are a writer and you write a book, you see all the mistakes. If you are an artist, when you look at 
your artwork. You see the, the hard parts, the, the things that, that didn't come out right. Other people don't necessarily even see it unless you point it out. But we seem tend to see that, so those sorts of things in ourselves. So the art of magic we, we, we need to do is accept those parts of ourselves, the shadow, of course, right? Mirror darkly, the shadow aspect. Uh, once we are able to integrate or come to terms with the shadow, then we're empowered. So that's what it's saying, basically. So maybe between now and the next time we meet, think about um, what your favorite mythology would be and how you might incorporate that into a temple consecration. Um, take that as a homework. You don't have to write one, but think about it. Whatever your favorite world mythology would be or a personal vision or something like that and write it down and just think about it. And maybe next time we meet, we can talk about that um, and share on that subject. So the beginning, we perhaps toll some bells to get our focus together and be thinking about what we're doing. And then we have this very, very short, it's only a couple paragraphs of a guided visualization to say, okay, get out of where you are and we're going on the journey. The next part of a temple consecration is the creation of the lustral water or holy water. All three of these rituals have that in common. Um, and so basically what you're doing is this. You're going to create sacred space, so you need to bless it. You need a way to bless the sacred space and create the lustral water or holy water. Uh, so you need to create it first. And as a magician, you're also a priest. And so you can do this. It, they're all going to involve the mixing of water and salt, the, representing the polarities, because as we work magic, it involves the uniting of polarities, you know, the masculine and feminine in its most abstract or basic form, water being the feminine element and salt being the masculine. Now, form and pattern, force and form. Polarities like that, they're not opposing polarities. They're polarities that need each other in order to manifest reality. So for the star temple, first you want to bless, you list to have a chalice and, okay, so maybe I should back up a minute. To create the holy water, what you want to have is a cup and a saucer of some kind. You can go to your kitchen cabinet or whatever and find something. I used to use a wine glass and a glass uh, saucer. And so on the saucer itself, you put a small amount of salt. Some people will like to use um, sea salt. That's perfect. Sea salt is fantastic. You can also use um, uh, the cooking salt, the kosher salt, because it's kosher, it's purified. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. If you have nothing else, you can use kitchen salt. If you don't even have that, you can use your imagination. Just use your imagination, it's fine. But the idea is like you have this paten, this dish, a saucer from a teacup is fine and a cup. So you put the water in the cup and the salt on the paten, on the, on the saucer, and you put them together. And so you, when you get ready to do the work, you put that in front of yourself or go to where it is, if you, you know, whatever works. And so the first thing you want to do is bless the water. Uh, for the Star Temple, uh, the verbiage is, in the name of the stellar guardians of the grail, uh, of divine wisdom, I bless the water contained in this chalice, may it become sacred as the flowing waters, as the infinite cosmic sea. There's some words, and there'll be an action. Usually you would draw an invoking pentagram of 
spirit receptive. You could also just simply draw a, a downward pointing triangle for water oh, and breathe your breath, your newman, over the water to sanctify it and bless it, depending on, on the ritual design. So if you wanted to use the invoking pentagram of spirit receptive, that would be going from earth to water. These are the two receptive elements across the bottom of the tree, across the muhadara chakra. If we can imagine this is a person of the head, arms, legs, the spirit energy descends like that, just like down the spine. Like when we're doing the middle pillar, we're doing the Kabbalistic cross, energy comes down. So spirit receptive would be like this. We're a downward pointing triangle for water. We're breathed over it. Uh, the movement of your breath. Then you put the cup aside, put it out of the way because you want the salt. So then you would bless the salt. For the star temple, I bless the salt upon this pentacle with the divine forces of the Gnosis that transcend all polarities. Made it embody the strength of formation. So that's that verbiage. So for, and, okay, so if you, for blessing it, you can even draw an upright triangle that represents the element of fire. Or if you want, you can use the spirit active. So spirit active would be from fire to air. You have two active elements, fire, very fiery and active, and air, very active element. Monkey mind, a lot of thinking, a lot of activity. So you would draw it like this. Cross, down, up, down, and back to back to air to finish the bar. So when I wrote the Temple of Limitless Light, I put my own ideas in. The water, most pure substance, you're the first. Without limits, without form. You're the basis for all that is. So it's space space itself as a thing. And then for the salt, most perfect fractal, you are the second. You are the you are found with all things but have no substance of, of your own. You are the pattern of all creation. So those are my own ideas. And then you mix them. You take some salt or it, you can pour it in if you want or you can grasp a handful of the salt, it doesn't have to be all of it, and put it into the water. And then you can say something at that point. So the star temple, which is pretty good, has a pretty good, um, the divine magic of Chinook is the perfect union of opposites. The mixing of the sacred salt and water is the first act of uniting the polarities. The creation of a holy elixir, which shall consecrate the stellar temple. And you can blow over it, you can mix it, however you want to go about it. But that's the important thing is that you recognize that you are creating sort of the divine substance of the universe, the, the basis for all that is, the, um, the, the perfect essence of reality that's completely sacred and pure. Uh, so what I wrote for our temple consecration, motion is the child of space and time. All things move, all things live. This holy elixir embodies the forces of creation that it may sanctify the sacred temple. Then you lift up the chalice and say, let there be light. So you've created holy water at that point, which you can save and use for other things. But at this point, what we're going to do is the next phase where we purify the temple by the elements. So introit, holy water, purification by the elements. So what we would do, basically what you want to do uh, is walk around the temple with the holy water and sprinkle it. once around, 
going clockwise, the osal following the path of the sun. And then take the incense burner and move that around. So we've sanctified the temple with water. You can then sanctify, I mean, it really represents water and earth because the, the combination of the elements. Moving the incense burner around represents fire and air. So at that point, you've sanctified the space with all four elements. Uh, the consecration of the Temple of Kim has a little bit more. So earth and water, they do the chalice and they have some verbiage. The waters of the Nile rise and bring up to us a rich earth, which sustains the land of Kim. This ground is sanctified by the waters of that sacred elixir and made holy through the strength of the fertile soil despotted, deposited on the banks of the Nile. Okay, so then you take the incense around and they have some verbiage. The incense arises from the perimeter of the circle towards the sky as an offering in the gods and goddesses of the twin lands of the pyramids. The rising smoke embodies the desert breezes which bear the sweet scents of spices and of the desert rose. Very nice. And then they add an extra step here where they take the candle around or uh, a light source, basically fire. The tongues of flame cast their rays of illumination throughout the confines of the circle, dispelling the darkness of ignorance and fear and exalting the solar disk of Ra in all his splendor. Very nice. And then they bless the center, which is unique to this ritual. So you've sanctified your space with all four elements. The water, uh, the sacred water representing earth and water, the passive elements. And you can just use the incense burner. A stick of incense is fine because it represents fire and air. The, the other two elements, the active elements. And since obviously the smoke rising up and the burning is the fire. So at that point, you need to have a statement to say something along the lines of the temple has been purified. That's established. So the next piece that, that is common to all the temple consecrations, and this is uh, in the document that um, on our on our temple consecration document with our uh, temple of limitless light, the separation of sacred space. So at this point, you're actually drawing a circle. Now I'm sure everyone's seen um, woodblock prints and old images of a magician standing in a circle of protection. While you can draw one on the floor, and if you like that, please do it. Draw a circle on the floor, and some people even uh, use a piece of rope uh, that they make into a circle and put that on the floor to represent the circle of protection. That's that's cool too. And then you can take the rope with you if you want to use it someplace else. Uh, Lon Milo talks about using a basically a consecrated uh, laundry cord you know, <laughs> the backyard, because uh, he's very into using what's at hand, that he uh, converted into a piece of temple equipment. He doesn't hang his laundry on it anymore, but he has a, a cord that's a, that makes a nice circle. And so he puts that on the floor and sometimes wraps it around himself. So he stays within the circle. That can be done. And if you want to do it, I encourage you to research circles and come up with one. But in this style of magic, the circle itself is implied. We don't actually have to draw it. We're going to symbolically draw it, uh, which is really the more the style um, consistent with the Golden Dawn is when we do the LBRP, we're creating an implied circle, uh, which is just as good. Usually the instructions are that you take the sword, if you have one, and go and draw a line around the outside of the temple, symbolically separating the mundane from the sacred. 
as we're going into sacred space, we're going into sacred reality, sacred time, you, the, you symbolically separate the two. It's also uh, a line of protection. It can be looked at as that. It's the boundaries of your creative space in which you are going to do your spiritual work. Uh, and again, that's in here. The ring of traditional ring of fire. So for the Egyptian one, they call it the division of Amenti, which is the sacred land of Egypt. Uh, the steel blade flashes in the flickering light as we separate the sacred space from the illusions of the mundane. Time is dissolved as we enter a reality of our own construction. Worlds beyond all space and time, infinite worlds that lie beyond the Nile. Uh, the Star Temple. Star Temple has a few pieces I haven't read at all. So in the, the Star Temple, the story starts out, unity became duality, except this third force that wanted to help humanity. When they do the purification by the elements, uh, they have a story that they read about how the Nephilim, these uh, teachers came and gave humanity all this knowledge. The eons passed and mankind, humanity, proceeded to evolve. The verbiage needs to be updated. As we increased our capabilities, the conflicting forces of light and darkness utilized us as pawns in their struggle. The stellar guardians of the grail, who wish to assist the process of human evolution and free us from ignorance, sent 200 of their number to Earth, bringing with them the fire of divine wisdom. The Nephilim descended upon the Earth and taught humanity the sacred art of magic, the secrets of the stellar realms, and the blessings of the elements. And so that's what you would say while you were blessing the temple with the four elements. So when you get to the, the ring of fire, you get to the consequences. So the instructions are taking the sword, the magician draws an arc around the perimeter of the circle, projecting a fiery energy from the point of the sword. Humanity was not prepared to receive the ancient stellar wisdom of the Nephilim. We abuse the powers, using the most high magic for petty purposes and to gain control over others. Great magical battles were fought and a contagion of evil covered the earth. The stellar lords, seeing humanity's folly, dispatched four mighty angels to seal the Nephilim and their magical arts in the dimensions between worlds where they silently await our coming to once again acquire the ancient star lore of the Nephilim and must prove ourselves worthy. Having done so, we will be given the keys to unlock the stellar gates and commune with the keepers of the divine wisdom. <clears throat> so in the division of Amenti, we're separating mundane from sacred. And the Star Temple were representing how we were separated from the source of gnosis and knowledge and that we have to regain it. But the idea is basically the same. <clears throat> different point of view, different approach, but we're drawing a circle. And the Temple of Limitless Light. A little more generic, a little more straightforward. So as you draw with the sword, circle of light. This is a cauldron of transformation wherein all wonders are possible. Let the great works accomplished here reverberate throughout heaven and earth. As it is below, so shall it be above. As it is within, so shall it be without. So here the emphasis is more on this is the cauldron of transformation. This is the space where miracles happen. And we're going to do these great works within it, and they're going to reverberate outward. Now it says the sword, but if you don't have a sword, you, don't, you can just use your finger. That's fine. Um, the sword being uh, the elemental tool of air, its function is to unite and divide things. 
here it is being used as a cutting tool to divide things, but the intellect also unites things by seeing similarities between things. We name things and put them into groups and that can separate things, but it also can group things together, similar things, and that way it unites. So that's the main function of the sword. It also can be used to draw lines of force, which we'll get into later. All right, so you can see the whole thing is building, right? We're setting everything up. <clears throat> We've left <clears throat> on our journey. We've sanctified the area by the four elements. We've drawn the line of the circle, the circle of protection, the circle that defines our sacred space, our universe, our creative space in which we are going to do our work. So now we're ready to do it. Now we're ready to rock. So what we do next in all of these rituals is invoke the four watchtowers. Now, when we do the LBRP, we're creating this pentagram that's going to clean out and vanish. And we use the same one for, for Earth because it's the general, the lesser meaning general, it's like the big broom that sweeps out or calls in everything so the earth represents basically the combination of all elements all four elements under spirit that allows the the four elements to connect together but remain separate enough that they have their own unique qualities and so that's how why we use earth when we go to the four directions we want to invoke the four elements unto themselves so when we go to the east, we do the invoking pentagram of air because that's where the sun rises. That's where the beginning of the things are. And the east has the qualities of being um, hot and moist or the eastern winds, according to uh, Ptolemy. I think it's Ptolemy. So when we go to the east, we do airy things, airy symbols. We draw invoking symbol of air. Now, I know this is complicated and it's difficult uh, when you first see it, but there's a logic behind it. And if I think I can show you a way that it'd be easy to remember. So at the top of the pentagram, we have air and water. Right? So we have the water being the emotional feeling aspect, and the air being the intellectual thinking aspect. So when we want to invoke air to the east, we go away from water towards air. Less emotional, more intellectual. And of course, being a polarity, each one contains some of its opposite. Air and water both contain each other. Water contains air, so because the fish can breathe, right? And the fish still need oxygen. They have gills and they can get air from water and they can breathe. We have fish and plants underwater. We have a whole ecosystem. So there is air contained within water. Air obviously contains water because we have humidity and rain and things like that. So these two have a special relationship. If you want to invoke air, Go from water to air. If you want to invoke water, becoming less thinking and more creative and feeling. Right? So that one's pretty easy to remember. And you already know Earth, right? So you're banishing Earth, invoking Earth. So if you know banishing and invoking Earth, then you just do the same thing on the other side with fire. So sorry, it's the image is reversed for me and uh, Zoom. So banishing and invoking earth, you would do the same over here with fire. Banish fire and invoke fire. And to be honest, you're not going to be banishing elements other than the earth, probably ever. But still the idea. So we go from spirit to fire. We go towards the element to invoke it. Boom, 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 boom. Invoking fire. And 
invoking earth, invoking air, invoking water. Always finishing the, repeating the first bar to make sure that you have created a complete and solid pentagram in your visualization. So, and you can also just draw it on uh, your notes, which is what I did in the beginning to always have it in front of me. I would draw the little milking pentagrams. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, and then the spirit pentagram is the only one that's weird where it goes across the bottom because spirit is descending through this, the Muladhara, the chakra, the basal, basal chakra. You can imagine the person standing here. So anyway, that's that. So, and all four of these, I mean, all three of these temple consecrations, we go to the four directions and we evoke a spiritual guardian and an element. The temple of Kim is a little bit different. What they did here is they took Libra Resh, the four daily adorations to the sun and map it onto the four directions because that works. So in the east, you go and you draw the evoking air. Powered up with the invoking spiral. And then there's a verbiage, and you basically do Libra Resh. Hail unto thee who art Ra in thy rising, even unto thee who art Ra in thy strength, who travels over the heavens at the uprising of the sun, with the hoodie in its splendor at the prow, and Rahor abiding at the helm. Hail unto thee from the abodes of the night. So that's the morning adoration, of which you would also envision yourself as the god Ra. So that's at, at sunrise, then you would walk around to the south, continuing the line, and do the, the noon adoration for um, Hathor. So fire south, that's when the sun is at its highest point, it's the hottest. Hail unto thee who art Hathor and thy triumphing, even unto thee who art Hathor and thy beauty who travels over the heavens at the highest point of the sun in thy bark with the hoodie in its splendor at the prow and Rahor abiding at the helm. Hail to thee from the boats of the morning. So you would do this throughout the day too, right? when you get up at noon. So then you travel to the west. Draw the evoking pentagram of water. Powered up. Hail unto thee who are at tomb in thy setting, even unto thee who are tomb in thy joy, who travels over the heavens at the down going of the sun in thy bark with the hoodie and its splendor at the prow and Rahor abiding at the helm. Hail unto thee from the abode of the day. So Tomb is another form of Ra who represents sort of boundaries. And this is nighttime, the sun's going down. The Hudi is Toth. Rahur is the version of Horus that is used in the OTO for the most part. Um, child of the new eon. So he's guiding uh, the celestial bark. So you travel around to the north. Hail unto thee who art Kephra in thy hiding, even unto thee who art Kephra in thy silence, who travels over the heavens in thy bark at the lowest point of the sun, with the hoodie and the splendor of the prow and Rahor biting at the helm. Hail unto thee from the abodes of the evening. So that Kephra would be at the midnight hour or right before you went to bed. Kephra being the Kephra beetle, represents the regeneration of the sun, you know, the, kef the kefra beetle rolling the ball of the dung beetle ball, that's the sun at its darkest time because it's on the other side. Then you bring it around to the middle, 
and you invoke the four directions. So they took Libra Resh and made it into uh, a four direction, which is exactly what it is. It's completely legit the, the way this was written. Um, and Libra Resh is something that we should all be practicing in some form uh, uh, throughout the day. We've been doing it for a few years and it's, it's really cool. It's really fun. So they did that in an Egyptian theme. What we do um, and the other two, uh, the Temple of Limitless Light and in the um, Enochian Star Temple is we invoke the four archangels, the same as in the um, Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. The verbiage is slightly different, but the idea is the same. So let's consider the the Star Temple. So these four archangels, these four symbolic forces of the, the four directions, the four elements, uh, four letters of the great thought, the fours, they needed to protect humanity from knowledge that we weren't ready for. So they sealed it away uh, in the in-between worlds. They put a veil of obscuration. And so in order to be able to approach that knowledge and have access to it, we need to get ourselves straight. We need to balance the four elements within ourselves. So that is uh, the basic basis of the verbiage here. And we've talked about the four archangels quite a bit. Um, so I don't, I don't really feel the need to go over that again. Uh, and you'll notice in the document for um, the Temple of Limitless Light, I've drawn the little stars and giving you a starting point to make it easy. And we've reused the, the God names and we have little invocations of the, of the four angelic forces that are going to provide two functions. They're going to both act as words and protectors and they are going to give access to the spiritual powers at the level of our understanding and our capability. So the idea is that they are acting as valves in a sense. They will give us access to spiritual experiences at the level of our own understanding and act as protectors and uh, power sources in a sense. As we work with the LBRP when we're used to uh, drawing the pentagrams and clearing or invoking the energies because we can use that ritual for both things and visualizing the angels and building that connection that directly translates into a temple consecration where if you go to the east and you invoke Raphael you already have an experience of Raphael from doing the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. So you can have some kind of visualization, some kind of relationship that you built up with that spiritual being by doing the lesser banishing ritual or the lesser invoking a ritual of the pentagram. Probably you want to do both at, at some point. And so we go to the East, we do airy things, we invoke Raphael. We say um, words of power that go with the East, we draw the invoking pentagram of East. We power it up with the, with the invoking spiral. Boom. We've created the Eastern Watchtower. Watchtower is a term that's used for it because you can imagine it as being a big column of light of to the East, all things East-like, all things airy, all things Raphael, the Archangel. And then we go to the other four directions and we do the same thing. We have symbol that we draw to represent the power of that element. We have words of power that go with that. We can draw the mudras, the symbols, so air, fire, water, earth. You're basically touching the sky and earth. We can do the mudras too. So we get into each element as we go through, as we invoke each individual watchtower around the circle. However you do it, 
it's basically the same idea. Now, most of the time we're going to always use the four archangels because they represent the spiritual aspect of the four elements that we want to start as a strong basis for ritual. Even if we're going to do a planetary rite later, we want the elements there balanced and empowered that'll feed us energy. Okay. So that's that part. Introit, going to the other world, purification, separate, four watchtowers, boom, boom, boom. That's set. The next part is the most important in a way. Because what we're going to do is we're going to open ourselves up to the spiritual world, the other world. Because what we're going to do is unite the four watchtowers together. We're going to tie the four watchtowers together to a central node, creating a crossroads. Right? Because the crossroads is where it happens. That's where things meet. That's where the magic happens. And the crossroads, when you open it up, and then the spiritual world can come alive. That's where the magic happens. How you do this is a thing called, um, it's called the analysis of the keyword, which is kind of lame, but basically what you do is you reiterate what you just did. You say, um, that's one of these, is it in here? You take something that you did at each of the four directions and unite it into a single expression. You draw lines connecting to the center and then sort of reiterate it. If you, uh, you find the analysis of the keyword used in rituals like, uh, well, it's in the LBRP because at the very end of it, you say, around me flame the pentagrams, within me shines, or when the column shines a sixth ray star, you say, before me, Raphael, behind me, Gabriel, my right hand, Mikael, my left hand, Uriel. You're reiterating what you just did and uniting it within yourself and yourself being as a center. And other rituals, you may take the first letter of a, a word of power that you said at the four directions and combine them into a single expression, like an Atarquan, you know, like Agela is Adonai, Gabor, Leolam, Amen. Lord thou power forever. That's a notaric one. So if you have a word of power that you said in all four directions, you might take the first letter, the first syllable of that, and find a word that it would spell. So you're reiterating and uniting what you just did into a single expression within yourself. That's an analysis of the keyword, but really it's I wish I had a better word for it. It's a reiteration of what you just did to a single expression, uniting what you just did to a single idea, a single expression, and then within yourself, because you want to become the axis mundi. You want to become the center of the ritual. You've activated these four points, bring them together, unite them within yourself. And now you are the master of the temple. You are united with these four sources of power, these four spiritual allies, these four beings, and the axis mundi, the center of the world, runs through you. You're connected above to the highest of the high. You're connected, grounded below and to the center of creation. Your four allies are around you, and the energy is flowing. You are, to me, it's kind of like creating your uh, spaceship. When I really activate the temple, through these actions, it becomes a magical. Uh, it's indoctrinating us into a symbolic world. Uh, I wouldn't say this indoctrinating um, idea that there is a pattern, and the pattern can be filled in with your own system of symbolism. That's the thing. 
The reason you study magic is to become a magician. To become a magician, you have to determine what your own inner worldview is, what your own way of looking at reality is, and what your own view of it is. And so the pattern, a bell, guided visualization, creation of the holy water, purification of the elements, the division, four watchtowers, unite them within yourself. That's action of creating a temple consecration. Those are the steps. After you get used to the ones that we have available, which we have three, and there's another one, it's a grail one. Um, but I think three examples is enough to get started. Once you're capable of doing this and you're comfortable with it, you would put your own symbol symbology. You would see the journey of becoming a magician and becoming in contact with your holy guardian angel, the higher self, uh, the inner teacher. As you get closer to that, it will teach you. It will give you information on how to write rituals to become more in contact with your own holy guardian angel. So I wouldn't say that it's indoctrinating us into a symbolic world system. The idea is that it helps you to determine what your symbols are by experience, by these sort of visionary experiences. But it's a good question. And a symbolic mythological way of looking at the universe is a tool. It's one tool. As you can see, I like all three of these. I like the Temple of Kim. I think it's a really awesome one. Uh, I really enjoy the, the way they took Lee Resh and turned it into the four directions. I think it was beautiful. It's, 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 it's genius. So I can do a Temple of Kemp and enjoy it a lot. The Nakian Star Temple, though, is, I have to say, is my favorite. Because anything in Nakian, I love. And it has uh, a really nice um, invocation written in a Nakian at the end of it that I really love doing. And, and um, I have it memorized. It's pretty short. So I can do Egyptian, then I can go to an, an Anakian version. Depending on which ritual I may be doing that evening, one may be more appropriate than the other. And then we have the one that we wrote for our group, uh, Temple of Limitless Light, which is based on my own personal mythology. So I'm not indoctrinated. I see, I perceive a, uh, an effective ritual pattern that then can be animated in many different ways, different points of view, which can all be correct uh, in their own way, in their own time. But those are interesting things to discuss. But the idea that I'm trying to get across is that there's an effective pattern, an effective pattern to use, but then can be given life through mythology, through symbolic storytelling that makes it alive, that makes it exciting and enjoyable to do, that lifts us up and takes us on a spiritual journey, right? Like the salt and the water. The salt representing the pattern, right? The fractal, the pattern of creation and the water being the substance. You have a pattern for ritual, and if you learn the ritual patterns and understand them, then you can dress them up. You can give them the life through symbolic imagery that we can experience on a very deep level by animating them through the act of storytelling that takes us to um, a much higher place, a spiritual place. When we want to communicate with our higher selves, we come in contact with the collective unconscious. We want to do it through mythic storytelling because that engages parts of ourselves 
beyond simply the intellectual, the narrator, which I'm not dissing the narrator, but we kind of have to get it out of the way in order to have these sorts of spiritual experiences. And so the um, mythic aspect, the storytelling aspect is what gets us in touch with the higher self. So the pattern again, a little meditation or something at the beginning, LBRP, not, not the LBRP, I mean, couples to cross the bells, ring to separate the mundane from the sacred, usually four for the four directions. Introit, guided visualization. Salt in the water, creating holy water. Blessings of the elements, the sword separating space, create the four watchtowers, unite them together within ourselves. That's the temple consecration. Um, there are also, like say the Golden Dawn, they would have temple openings, one for each element, depending on, um, that's, that may perhaps be another subject because it has a little bit different uh, connotation. So that would be the idea is that if you want to look at these four documents, you can compare and contrast. They're not all exactly the same for patterning. As I, you can see the, uh, the early one that they wrote, the Temple of Kim, the Egyptian style one, has a couple extra steps that they, they added in, um, or the later ones were more streamlined. Um, but the pattern remains. And that is written up in at the beginning of ours, Temple of Limitless Light, I talked a little bit about the pattern. It's like a little page of information. And then you can see what's in it. Um, and then of course you can have a final oration where once you've done all this work, you've created the sacred space, you want to say the temple structure is now complete. You want to verbalize that. And of course, connecting the nodes together is important too. The temple structure is now complete. I declare this temple to be open. Uh, the one that I like, I've uh, taken from Golden Dawn. Uh, and the word perokath, and then the sign of the rending of the veil. I declare the temple has been open. Uh, perokath is a mysterious word, but basically it's the veil the veil of obscurement between the lower sephra and uh, the sephra at the middle of the tree in the tree of life. If you can imagine the four below, Malkuth, Isod, Nisach, and Hod. And that's kind of where we're, we, we've been working with the temple consecration. Then there's the veil of Perakath, and above it is Tipereth, which is what we're really trying to reach. The rending of the veil of Tipereth of a paragraph so that we can rise up to the higher dimensions of the tree. Uh, as a, if you can consider a, a sort of a map of consciousness of journeying into the underworld. So the final statement, I think it's important. It's important, I think, especially when you're working in a group to state the temple is here, we're here, we're ready. And then that's when you begin the greater works at that point. I think that is what I have to talk about today as do we have any other questions? Do you want to ask anything posted in chat before I turn off the recording? And then we can have a, a, dis, a further discussion if you like. Okay, so let me hold this up one more time. Because this is, I think, the thing that people have the hardest part with. So when you do your LBRP, you're banishing Earth, going from Earth to Spirit. Invoking Earth, go from Spirit to Earth, bringing the Spirit down to manifest it in the Earth. So fire is just over, the same thing over here, it's on the other side. Spirit to fire. And then water and air, you just go back and forth across the top. 
very simple. The only weird one is spirit. But then you have to think about water and earth being the two passive or reflective elements yeah. from earth to water. Fire and air being the active. Fire to air. And that's it. Those are the ones that you're basically going to use. You're very, it's doubtful that you would have to be in a fire. Um, I don't recall ever having to do that, but I'm sure, you know, knowing it is good because the banishing earth is the, the one that you're going to use for protection that you've learned in the LBRP. All right, so I will stop the recording now.